Okay. It is the BWF. Um, it is the BWF coaching conference. So BWF, we get a chance to give you a little update on what we do, what we're doing, uh, new programs, a new policy a little bit as well because we have got a new strategic plan in place. So you can get further details of the strategic plan. It's all online. It's all on the website. You can look at it any time. But I'm going to just give you some of the basics this morning to start us off. So the vision and mission are quite simple. Hopefully some of you know these. The vision is to make badminton a leading global sport, accessible for all, giving every child a chance to play for life. Now, it's a simple phrase, but it's got a lot of implications for coaches. Because giving every child a chance to play, I'm sure a lot of you can relate that to our shuttle time program. A lot of you will be aware of that. But giving them a chance to play for life, we're saying we want to keep them in the game. And how do we keep them in the game? We provide them with facilities, opportunities, and coaching and coaches to guide them and to keep them in the game. So the coaching pathway is very important, and I'll come back to that a little later. Uh, a quick question. How many people have actually done the Shuttle Time program or are aware of the Shuttle Time program? Oh, wow, that's much better than two years ago, so maybe we're in the right direction. How many Level 1 coaches? Wow, that's good. Uh, level 2? Any Level 2s? Okay, and some tutors. There's some tutors out there. Great, great. That's really good news. Okay, so the mission is broader across uh, BWF. Not so relevant to what we're doing today, but to lead and inspire all stakeholders, deliver entertainment through exciting events, to drive fan experience, and create innovative, impactful, and sustainable development initiatives. The last bit about development initiatives is more related to this morning. But I hope you see you around the World Championships. Has everybody had the chance to go in and have a look yet? Yeah? Fantastic stadium. When you look at the presentation on court, I hope you see that actually there's been a lot of progress made in that area, and that's about providing entertainment that makes sure that people that see badminton for the first time, either on TV or live, they want to come back. We've got to get them the first time. If we lose them the first time, it's very difficult. And of course, those things are underpinned by some values. OK, the bit that concerns us really is the participation. But in the BWF perspective, we divide it into four areas. Capacity building, partnerships, entertainment, and participation. But of course, at the center of that is about, it's all about the athlete. It's all about what we can do for the athlete at all levels, at participation level, but also at performance level. Um, we developed some principles. When we set off on this journey in 2011, when we started to put in place a strategy as to how we were going to develop the game in a more structured manner, we tried to put on paper some key principles about how we wanted to do that. And the very at a very, very basic level, we started to talk more and more about more and better. We wanted we, to really improve the game and advance our sport. We need more coaches more players, more officials, more competitions, more administrators. So how are we going to go about doing that? So if you bear in mind as we go through, that's the objective. So we set out from in the strategic plan from 12 to 16. We set out and looked at all those areas about, well, these are the key areas we've identified. Now what do we do? How do we do that? Who's going to deliver for us? Because BWF can't deliver. It's going, to be the re it's going to be delivered from a regional level, from the Continental Confederations, our partners in the regional uh, organizations. But more importantly, it's going to be from the member associations. And in BWF, traditionally, probably up until about probably 2010, we actually had cont regular contact with maybe 30, 40 of our members, bearing in mind that we've got 180 plus members. We had no contact points. We had no points of interest for them because we weren't providing anything to the majority of our members. And particularly the less developed, the developing and less developed members. At that end, really, we hadn't really got a connection with them. We hadn't got communication with them. So how are we going to do that? And the answer really, having identified the areas, 
was then to try and create some resources to help them grow themselves and then to provide some training and funding behind that to help them implement these programs. So in lots of these areas, these are the first ones we started with. We started with the shuttle time resources because we said, what do our members need? They probably need something that helps them get more players to grow the game. You grow the game, more people not only play it, but more people become aware of it. You create more interest. You get more buy-in from people. So we felt participation was probably the starting point. Where you've got participation, you're going to need coach education. How are we going to help educate those coaches? Well, we probably need to do some research. We need to get involved with some sports science to find out what the latest, uh, the latest developments are that can help our coaches and educate our coaches. Then we said, really, we desperately want to be seen as an inclusive sport. So para badminton needed to be included. And you'll see some more examples of inclusive badminton later in the presentation. But we said, right, we want to get into the games. We want to get into the Paralympic Games because that will be the catalyst that opens up avenues to get more uh, para-athletes involved in badminton. And as you know, we've achieved that now and we will be in the para games for the first time in Tokyo 2020. And the last one is, how do we help our players? Well, we need to educate our players because it's a changing world and we need to provide some services for them so we need to develop some resources around, around our players to help them. So we set about trying to create a suite of resources. And the second phase came in, so training for event managers to improve the level of events in, in our member nations, uh, a talent pathway resource to help our members set up some structures to help them develop higher level elite players. On the other side, to handle all of this, where you've got more players and more activities, you need better administrators, so administrative courses, and of course, technical officials to try and improve the level of technical officials and motivate more people to come into our sport as technical officials. So, this was really the objective from 12 to 16, to develop this suite of resources, this suite of educational uh, services to help grow our members and to grow the game on a regional and at a regional and national level. This was very much phase one. And on the whole, we're very close to competing all this. There's one or two areas that we're a little bit behind with, but basically we achieved that in 12 to 16. So moving forward to 16 to 20, how are we going to implement? Well, we need the strategic plan, we need operational programs, and we need planning, not only at BWF level, but those, there needs to be goal alignment between BWF, the continental confederations, and the member associations. And that goal alignment is actually critical to the efficiency that we're looking for when we put in quite considerable funds into these programs now. And that's, that's sort of the bedrock of what we're doing. We need to strengthen the CCs and MA leadership and capacity. So there's more grants going into the continental offices. So we're in Europe, but the audience is mainly European. You'll see that Badminton Europe now has more staff. It has some more uh, capacity in terms of funding from BWF. It's also developed its own commercial streams as well. So we're trying to help our continental confederations grow because they're the ones that are going to deal directly with their members. They know their members better than we do. We don't know, we can't know what is now 190 members. So it's to grow that. And the two key focuses, very, very simple. It's a simple diagram. We want more and we want better. So, I'm not going to run through all these today, don't panic. It's a quick slide to show you. In terms of participation, you'll recognize some of these that are already in place. Uh, shuttle time, shuttle time you know. Uh, we, you know that we've done a lot of work on the University of Badminton. We're a permanent sport now in the University Ad and the World, Champion, World University Championships. We do a lot of work now around para development, Women in Badminton, we run some specific uh, programs in areas where female participation in sport is generally low such as, the, uh, low, such as the Gulf states. So we've got a lot of different programs where we're trying to make sure that badminton becomes a very inclusive sport. The two new ones for you probably to look at are outdoor badminton, 
because we know in many parts of the world people are getting their first experience outdoors, not indoors. So it's really important that that experience is as close to the real game as possible. Therefore, we've invested in developing an outdoor shuttlecock that is more stable and gives a better experience for people playing outdoors. And the other one is around this area, which is a, a real uh, emphasis in the world at the moment about sport for health and sports contribution towards a healthy population. And badminton has an awful lot to offer in that area. So we're investing more in research to put our case forward as what a healthy sport we are. Performance related projects, so this is the better element. So there's more funding available at regional level for player development programs. We work very closely with Olympic Solidarity. We've got a few coaches in the room that have delivered Olympic Solidarity courses. I see Joe, Ian, there's a few around that deliver on a regional basis to developing and less developing countries, coach education, shuttle time programs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's some different programs around itinerant coaches, pathway resources, and of course the coach education, which we're going to come on to in a second. Coach education. This is probably the one you're most interested in. Um, the objective at the beginning was to uh, open up coaching in many ways. Again, we did a survey at the beginning when we started out. How many members had... Um, how many members? At the time, I think we had 176 members in 2011 when we started looking at this. Of those 100 and 176, how many had coach education systems? Any rough guesses? A few more than five, but it's a low percentage. There were just under 30 that actually had them. Of those 30, 15 of them we're running one or less courses a year. So active coach education programs were very, very limited globally. And there was a real thirst for it. So we felt it was an area that we could have an impact that would give us some return on the investment. So some of the key principles around that were we needed to keep it at a level that was accessible to developing and less developed uh, nations. So the level one award, some of you know, is very applied. It's very applied, it's very practical, it's designed to get people involved, to give them some confidence in the coaching area. What to coach and how to coach are the two basic areas. And the, the bottom point there was really critical to me. There's two critical points to uh, what we were doing. The first one is it had to be free. Anyone can download our coach education resources. It's a different thing to go to the, the courses. It varies from region to region about how we organize those. But the actual resources, the actual information, had to be free. And the second thing was we had to translate. And this was a difficult one with our council because we are an Anglo Anglophile uh, association. We're an English-speaking international federation. And it was very difficult to get council to say, we need to change that to actually grow the game. They were scared that if we started uh, translation, we'd have to translate absolutely everything. But in the end, translation has worked, as you'll see in a, a slide that will come up in a minute. I'm not going to go through this, but what I want you to see is the basic principles that we, we started off with a, a very simple framework. And we said, if we could achieve this, that would, be, that would really benefit badminton. So at the top, you've got the, this is the shuttle time program here, which is sort of entry level, but also to motivate that teacher workforce to deliver badminton rather than other sports. If we can get them educated and motivated by badminton, more kids get introduced to it in schools, more of them become aware of the sport, then it's easier to pick them up into coach situations. Coach Level 1 came out in 2012. There's a couple, I can see a couple of faces that were actually on the first pilots in the various regions. Uh, coach Level 2 came out in uh, about just under two years later. And the pickup has been really good. And coach level three is now ready. I apologize for the delay. I've already had that question over coffee last night. When, where's level three? Where's level three? It's there. It's there, honestly. We had a meeting this week. We've signed off the, the draft version. The videos of the supporting video clips have been filmed. 
and the first pilots will be run later this year. The first one will be in Europe at, the, at their new training centre. And level four, we're in negotiations with uh, various universities and a couple of networks of universities about how we can get that actually certified at a tertiary education level. A little update, translation, so level one, we've got uh, seven languages, I think, at the moment, but there's a couple more in production. I lose count. Of course, Sharon will correct me over there if I get that one wrong. Level two, we've already got uh, five language versions of that, and there's more in production. Uh, we've had over 9,000 downloads of the resources online. The views of the videos is amazing. Um, we've had over 3 million downloads of the coach, uh, coach education videos, which is pretty amazing, really, in that space of time for the sport of badminton, that people have gone and been able to find it, download it, have a look at it, use it. That's been really good. And one of the players that's actually on the clips was a young player when we did the filming. She was actually here. And she said, oh, hello. Uh, she came over to say hello to me. And I said, have you, have you had a look recently? She said, no. I said, you've passed the three million. Three million people have looked at you demonstrating the straight smash. And we've got coaches qualified with BWF awards from over 70 countries now. OK, next steps. Uh, in the meantime, since we started it, some other countries have actually looked at it and said, well, we actually want to do our own thing. We don't want to do BWF route because we have to fit in certain criteria from our NOCs or our departments of sport. So it's also been a catalyst to get more countries to actually write their own coach education, which is great. And some of them have used the BWF resources, no problem. Uh, some of them have chosen to go their own way and look at some of the major countries programs like Denmark's, uh, um, trying to think of some of the others, the Canadian, the Canadian model has been used by some countries. So, but there's, the key thing is it's been a catalyst to get more countries to start to look at this. Uh, so what we're going to do next, now once the level three is launched this year, next year we'll be coming out with a table of competencies which will be circulated to our members. So any member that has their own system can apply to us for equivalent status of their awards. So we will recognize, if they meet the criteria, we'll recognize their, their award schemes. And what we'll do is then pull everybody into the same basket. So everybody will know if you're trying to employ a coach or if you're talking to a coach, what level they are. There will be a reference then for the, for the level of the coach. What that will also allow us to then do is move towards coach licensing, which um, it's a slightly controversial area. Many, many international federations have gone that route now. But with everything that's happening in sport today, unfortunately, it's really critical that we have a direct line of con uh, communication with our coaches, that we can inform them of latest developments, that we can inform them of new WADA regulations, that we can inform them about integrity issues. Uh, you know, it, it's been widely publicized. Sports have a lot of problems with gambling at the moment, and badminton's had one or two problems. We have players who've been approached, it's been in the press, and what we need to do is to be able to have a direct line to the coaches to warn them, to educate them, and to let them know. And above all, we need to have control of our field of play. At the moment, technically, anybody can go down onto the court in these world championships. If they've got an accreditation from their country, they can go and sit in a coaching chair. We haven't got control over the quality of that person and the safety of that person as a coach. And we need to get control of that as a sport. So that will be coming, and that will probably come into place, I would suggest, for immediately after the Tokyo Games. Shuttle time. Uh, it's something that I think all of us in BWF are very proud of. And we'll come to some statistics in a minute, but I just want to start with a very short clip.
few brief images of, uh, shuttle, of the Shuttle Time project. There might be a couple of faces actually that are in the room that sneaked on the video there. Okay, Shuttle Time. The vision was to make uh, badminton one of the most popular, if not the most popular school sport in the world. And I can tell you today that over three million children have played badminton in the world for the first time through the Shuttle Time program, which when you think we only launched in 2012, is a pretty impressive figure. Uh, it's designed to offer a very simple training course for teachers, which motivates them and gives them everything they need to make it as easy as possible for them to deliver a safe, fun, instructive experience of our sport. We spoon feed. They've got the videos. They've got the lesson plans. They've got everything they need to make it easy for them to go out and give a fun experience of our sport. That's the logistics of it. You've got the teacher's manuals, the lesson plans, the clips. It's a full thing. And the new things, hopefully you've all got it on your phones. Maybe I should test you and get you all to get your phones out. The mobile app is available, is out there, and it's got everything on there, and it's got it in 17 languages. So you can see how accessible it actually is. Um, these are the latest stats. So now we're actually, as of today, we've got 119 countries who've in implemented or are in the process of implementing the program. We've got over 20 language versions. We've had over 17,000 online uh, registrations. We've got 1,600 tutors. We've actually got over 25,000 teachers now. And the views on the videos is 1.2 million views plus. So it's becoming a very established program and if I'm being boastful, I don't know, or what we know is that this is the biggest international federation program of its sort. There's no other international federation out there that has a program of this level that hits this market. Okay, we talked about the coach education, and coach education is an ongoing thing. Coaching science, as it's now called in many places, is developing. And we heard yesterday of Kenneth's research, uh, John talked a little bit about some of the research he's done, and that's what's happening. More and more serious people are coming into this area, not only of coach education, but we've also got some top experts, and you're going to hear more today. We've got Mark King this afternoon. We had Kenneth last night. Uh, we've got some really top people who are starting to research and look at badminton in a more scientific manner. And the reason that we're supporting that and funding it is that we want to... Um, we want to inform this coach education process and we want our coaches to be the best informed sports coaches out there. It's pretty simple. So the three areas that we're, we're really uh, looking to do when we support these projects, it's encourage and widen interest and investment in research in badminton, improve the level and quality of scientific material available to players, coaches and badminton practitioners and contribute towards an increased knowledge of performance and safety at international level for coaches and players and what we've done this year is we've tried to target it more towards some of the key uh, strategic focuses that you saw and that is that we've targeted it at the health health aspect for participation and the injury prevention for the performance level players to do more research to try and understand more about the types of injuries and maybe some preventative uh, programs to assist our members to have less injuries with their elite players. This year was a record entry. We've had 35 applications from 18 different countries, and it's growing each year. Uh, you're going to hear both of these this afternoon, so I'm not going to talk too much about them. But the, what, the thing I want to flag up here is that both these studies, the shoulder injury study and the optimum smash study, have been linked directly to world championships here. So 55 players have been tested on the smash. 55 competing players in the World Championships have been through testing on the smash to give us more information. And Mark will talk more about that this afternoon. And the shoulder injury, every player had a survey, every player has, comp uh, has had a survey to complete. And so far, the response has been very, very good from the, from the various countries. We haven't got a final figure yet, but it's looking positive. And you'll hear more about those later. Uh, this is just a quick sample of the type of thing that's been happening downstairs.
That was Victor's opponent from last night. Chu from uh, Taipei. And Mark's going to show you more on this this afternoon, but it's, the, it's just a quick example of the type of thing that we're supporting. And you'll hear the results, some of the results from that, the early results from that later on in the day. Okay, just a quick conclusion, just to conclude. The key points really are, we've taken a strategic approach. We wanted to make sure that the resources were accessible, and to make them accessible, they had to be free and they had to be translated. These, th th these are critical factors to us. Once we gained the confidence of our council that these programs were successful, they were more willing to invest more money in. And the level of investment in each of these programs has continued to grow for the last five years. So there's investment, there's translation, and for me, very importantly, there's inclusivity. And incl inclusivity comes very often through the partnerships that we form. So we have very close partnerships, for example, with Special Olympics, where we do a lot of work now. We have a massive program with Special Olympics for intellectual disabilities on a global basis. And there, last year, there were 97,000 plus intellectual disability athletes who played in a badminton competition or a badminton event within the Special Olympics organization. So you can see that Shuttle Time's also, in its adapted version, been very effective in, um, in helping us towards that objective of inclusive, making our sport very, very inclusive. That's about my lot. It's a quick overview. Uh, I will, or can, oh sorry, just to say, there's, all these resources are available on the website. Anything, anything you're looking for, anything you've seen today, you will be fine on, fine on the website. If you can't find it on the website, just drop us a line at um, bwfdevelopment.org. That's my lot. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes for any questions, but I will be coming back with the panel later so we can maybe pick up some of these things later. Any initial questions about where we're going? No? Nope? That's great. John, do you want to uh, move things on? Thank you, Ian.